we are cracking open our bestiary and uncovering more information about the various creatures of Kryn. Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga episode. My name is Adam, and today we're going to discuss more Creatures of Kryn. I'd like to take a moment and thank my collaborator patrons, the Heroes of the Lance, and invite you to consider becoming a patron or member of this channel by visiting the links in the description below. You can even pick up Dragonlance gaming materials using my affiliate link. I am referencing many of the source books in both 1st and 2nd edition for this Creatures episode. If there are any creatures you would like included in future episodes, please leave a comment below. We've discussed the effects of the Greystone on the various creatures of Kryn, but there is no way to cover the vast scope of Dragonlance's denizens in one creature episode alone, so I'm returning from the Great Library of the Ages in Palanthus after much research with more wild and wonderful creatures. In the last episode, we began with dragons, and since the campaign setting has them in the name, let's return to feature even more dragon kin. Only this time, we are submerging ourselves in Kryn's vast oceans for the Amphidragon. Coming in at 25 feet long, the Amphidragon is no small creature. It looks like a giant toad with a small tail and vestigial wings. It is a mix of a green dragon and a sea dragon, like a chameleon, it can change its skin color to match its surroundings, making it nearly undetectable. It is able to use its tongue to catch its prey and even spit acid. That's not all, however, as its skin is covered by yellow warts, which contain acid as well. Kryn's sea dragons resemble giant turtles with a dragon's head. It hunts using sonar and is able to breathe a cloud of steam. It is capable of ESP, even controlling other sea creatures to assist it if needed. Staying beneath the waters deep under the Blood Sea, let's take a look at the Prickleback. These are aquatic versions of the Manticore. They're ostensibly fishy pincushions firing spines at its prey. They are masters at concealment, remaining nearly undetectable if desired. The King of the Deep was created from the life essences of former priests of Istar. It has the body of a fish, covered in hair with the head of a squid, and two monstrous pincers. It regenerates and projects a roar, striking fear into its prey. It's even said that its mouth is a gate leading directly to the abyss itself. Death statues are the vessels of the King of the Deep's essences. They look like petrified remains of men. They're capable of animation, however, and will attack relentlessly with their war maces. Their gaze is of the void of the abyss, and if you catch yourself looking into their stone eyes, you could be killed instantly. Let's travel back to the surface of Kryn, where the Slig are larger distant cousins of goblins. Standing at six feet tall, they have fangs and are covered in tough skin featuring horns. They have caustic saliva that they spit into their victims' eyes. They travel in tribes of four more warriors. There is an aquatic version called the Gaggler, which live in deep open waters, often attacking ships. Revenants are not exclusive to Dragonlance, but the variety found around the Blood Sea are. The Cataclysm killed the inhabitants of this region, and now they seek revenge on those responsible. The problem is, they don't know who it is that is responsible, so they question all who cross their paths, asking if, Are you the one? Their stare can paralyze you with terror, and unlike traditional revenants, they are not decomposed. Wemmick are large lion centaurs which roam the plains of Nordmar. They travel in great bands, Wemmick are pragmatic and tend to fight on behalf of what they see as the winning side of a battle. They have worked with the Dragon High Lords throughout the War of the Lands, but are not averse to changing factions. Traveling to Talidas reveals new creatures to be wary of, like the Desir. 
They stand at six or seven feet, though hunched over. Their disgusting appearance is due to plates or natural armor and pasty green-white rubbery flesh which exudes slimy gel, often polluted with dirt and debris. They have an aura of stench and decay about them. They prefer to attack their prey with their poisonous bite, though they dwell deep beneath the surface in tribes of over 50. Talitas is also home to fire minions, fearsome elemental beings who manifest from flames themselves. They're warriors, but not much is known about them as their habitat isn't conducive to biological study. They have a weakness in water and an immunity to all forms of fire, obviously. The Gurik Chal, or ghost people, are an offspring of the Ilkwar goblins of Talidas. Visibly, they resemble goblins only with severe abnormalities, which causes their parents to abandon them. They are not brave and will not fight to the death, preferring to sneak and steal, causing as much damage as quick as possible. They are solitary and rarely trust any other creature, preferring the life of the predator and scavenger. Crawling across the surface of the deserts of Talidas are the Skrit. These hulking carnivorous beetles are approximately five to six feet in height. They resemble fleas and are protected by domed carapace mottled brown and black. They hunt similar to ticks, waiting for its prey to wander near, then attack with their needle-like mouths pumping in a paralyzing enzyme. Once latched on, it will try to drag its prey back to its lair to feed. It will inject the second enzyme that slowly dissolves its food into a soupy, gelatinous mass. And if we delve beneath the surface again, we may run into the Horax. These are insectoid creatures. They sport twelve legs with powerful mandibles and durable chitinous plates down their backs. They're able to climb nearly any surface after their prey, and they are ferocious. They prefer to attack in packs, maximizing on speed to kill. Their natural armor is at times fashioned for humanoid use by the glass sailors of Talidas. Finally, I would like to discuss the Oathlorks. The Oathlorks are a combination of both chromatic and metallic dragons who refuse the call of Tachesis and their good dragon cousins to enter into the War of the Lands. Tachesis cursed her dragons for refusing her call, stripping them of their magic. Othlork's dragons are in most respects the same as their traditional brothers with the following exceptions. Black dragons found in the southern wilderness of Talidas are xenophobic, crazed and unpredictable. At times, wildly aggressive and others cordial and highly eccentric. Blue dragons have turned wildly aggressive to humans as they started the dragon wars and are cursed to honor their words precisely, thus they are reticent to make any promises or agreements whatsoever. Brass dragons are shunned by their cousins, which affects them as they are social creatures. This makes them starved for attention, visiting nearby tribes or even abducting travelers for companionship. Bronze dragons are ignorant to the goings-on in the world and are seen as backwards by their cousins. They hate minotaurs with a violent passion and are friendly to the creatures of the sea. Copper dragons turn from humorous and friendly to bitter and disenchanted with how they were treated. They're not above antagonizing their good dragon cousins, enjoying the amusing Talidus gnomes, and seeing the Minoi for the cosmic joke that they are. <laughs> Green dragons are not changed by Tachesis' curse, other than being bound to their territories. This means they will attack any and all who enter, and they cannot leave to mate, dwindling their numbers in the following years. Red dragons were stripped of their self-confidence. <laughs> they still desire bloodshed and the spoils of battle, but have a near-crippling sense of inferiority. <laughs> They've turned to ambushing opponents and being overly vain and boastful to overcompensate. Silver dragons stayed to protect the humans of Talidas, but were overcome with guilt for not entering the war where so many of their kind were killed. This guilt causes them to travel disguised among men, helping in any way that they're capable. They have turned to aggressively stamping out evil in all its forms. 
And lastly, the white dragons have changed the most. They have also been stripped of their powers, but blessed with great intelligence to know exactly what they've lost. This has amplified their rage and savageness. And that is all the time I have to discuss more Creatures of Kryn. I will return in a future episode to highlight some of the lost Creatures of Kryn. Do you have a favorite creature covered? Are there others that you would like to see featured? And finally, what do you think is the quintessential Dragonlance creature? Leave a comment below. I am able to create these weekly videos because of your attention and support. If you're not already a patron or member of this YouTube channel, I'd like to invite you to consider becoming one. If you would like to pick up any edition of Dragonlance Gaming Materials, feel free to use my affiliate link in the description. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga, and I hope you'll join me in the celebration. Thank you for watching, this has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, remember, after riding a battle scene between gods and dragons, nothing beats going shopping with a coupon. Margaret Weiss